Powering up this phone, we get two options. Music only for just the Walkman experience, or start phone, which demands a SIM card be inserted. This was still in the era when phones needed a SIM card to even start. Too bad if you needed your contacts or messages and your SIM breaks, or you put it in another phone. Fortunately, I have a pile of old SIM cards. I can easily just pop one in and access this phone. Now it says, insert correct SIM card, because this phone is SIM locked and it thinks it can challenge me. I'm going to unlock this phone using the SEMC tool unlocking software. This software only works with special TTL serial service cables. It's a good thing I made one of these in my last video. Unfortunately, in that video, I ended up not being able to flash new firmware into my K750. I don't think it's my cable though. I think it's my weirdly configured K750. Okay, Semk tool, do your thing and remove those SIM locks so I can access this phone. And then it throws an error. CXE version not supported. What kind of bullshit is this? Also, the phone's no longer turning on. I've killed my Sony Ericsson phone. The good news is, at least this phone is still responding to the flashing and unlocking software. There's some hope I can flash some new firmware into the phone to get it working again. With the firmware files loaded and ready, it's time to give this a try. The flashing process takes a bit longer than unlocking. It's looking good, the flash files are accepted by the phone. And just as it's finalizing the process, I get this CXE version not supported error again. And I still have a dead phone. Maybe I shouldn't be using this cracked version of SEMC tool. I'll have to switch to different software and try and fix my dead phone. This is XS++, some very nice freely available Sony Ericsson flashing software. And I really like all the extra details it gives as it's doing its thing. And just like that, the flashing process says that it's ended without any problems. And look at that. The phone is working again. It takes a minute or two to go through the initial setup process required after flashing. Okay, let's start the phone. But it's still SIM locked and XS++ doesn't have the ability to unlock phones. I also tried SE Tool 2 Lite, and despite having an option for unlocking phones and showing no errors during the process, I was unable to unlock this phone. At this stage, I'm just pleased my service cable has been working properly and that my phone is turning on again. SE Tool did give me a clue during this process though. It says network locked and 505-01 which means this phone is locked to a network rather than a specific SIM card. And 505-01 is Telstra. So all I have to do is swallow my pride about unlocking this phone and find an old Telstra card to get access. And with that, I now at least have this phone to a point where I can try it out. This is a Sony Ericsson W810 Walkman phone. This color variant is called Fusion White and it's in beautiful condition. The first thing I'm gonna do is try some different themes. I wanna go with something a bit darker and there's a ton of themes to choose from. I've noticed that some themes even change the layout of the menu, such as this one that gives a unique horizontal menu user interface. But I think I'll go with something classic and Walkman themed for this Walkman phone. Hmm, I've noticed there's a very slight camera bump and it won't sit completely flat on a table. Once again, Sony Ericsson were beating Apple to the punch on their features. I want to do a quick test on the camera and... The shutter sound is really loud on this phone and there's no way to turn it off because there are laws in some countries where camera phones must have really loud shutter sounds, such as in Japan or South Korea. Not sure what they think about recording video on phones with these laws. Speaking about recording video, this phone is quite the potato. But this was useful for another feature on the phone called Video DJ. You can join together photos and text and videos to make something different to send to your friends. 
Quite a nice inbuilt feature there. I'm also curious about the inbuilt games, especially after seeing the 3D games that came on the K750. There are two games on here. First is Johnny Crash, a fun kind of Flappy Bird style game. And the other game is called Quadrapot, and it's a fairly standard Falling Pieces style puzzle game. I wonder why they included 2D games in this model instead of the awesome 3D games that were seen in the earlier K750. Maybe they thought it was more mobile friendly to have these instead. Anyway, I think it's time to try some third party games. I just have to copy some games to my dual micro SD to memory stick adapter as shown in the last video. And if you're wondering how this joins together two micro SD cards into a single volume, I did a quick check and found that one of the micro SD cards now reports itself as being four gigabytes instead of its actual capacity of two gigabytes while the other card reports as being raw with no file system. So this adapter must be just joining these two cards together in the simplest way possible. Okay, I've got some games on here now, so let's go 3D. The first game I'm testing is called Deep Submarine Odyssey by Fish Labs. I really like the intro sequence. The gameplay has some unique mechanics and the game itself has a real atmospheric vibe to it. It's not too bad. I'm curious to spend some time with it and see if it's actually good to play. It's so weird to see the Nokia logo on a Sony Ericsson. Next I'm trying a Nokia game. This is called Bounce Back. This is a decent puzzle game. I'm not yet sure about the physics of the ball though. I've been getting a lot of game suggestions in the comments. Many of these games are from your suggestions. I really enjoy reading all the comments. Next up is Fantasy Warrior. This is a nice looking role playing game. I like the way the game uses eight way directions from the controls. The W810 uses a direction ring for navigation. This is a huge improvement over the K750 joystick in terms of reliability. The direction ring has proven to be much more reliable even under heavy use. I have to admit though, it's a bit bittersweet because when the K750 joystick works, it's really good to use in games. I much prefer it to this ring. Fantasy Warrior looks like a really decent game and very Zelda-like. Speaking of Zelda, there's a Zelda port available. It's unlicensed though, but well done on bringing Zelda to this platform. I wonder if Nintendo have noticed this. There's also a SimCity game called SimCity Societies. It's licensed from Electronic Arts not too bad, but you have to be really dedicated to play SimCity on this form factor. Next up, Galaxy on Fire 2, another Fish Labs game from the creators of Deep Submarine Odyssey. It has a similar sort of atmospheric vibe to it. This one is very hard to play, though I continue to like their style of games. A much more fun game to play is Diamond Rush. Thank you to everyone who suggested this game. This is a really nice mining puzzle game with a great retro feel to it. And just the sort of game that I like to play on these sort of devices, with nice graphics and an excellent game all round. I also found a copy of Marble Madness. This is a classic game that's great to play. I'm finding it a little bit tricky to control though. I'm really wishing this phone had a joystick like the K750. An interesting aspect of this game is that it has a Bluetooth multiplayer mode. So why not load it up onto my K750 and try some multiplayer? I just have to pair these two phones together over Bluetooth 2.0 and then run the game on both phones at the same time. It's interesting that the game starts up much faster on the W810. I wonder if that's just Java engine optimizations or the CPU is actually slightly faster on the W810. In the previous video, I said that the CPU in the K750 probably ran at about 110 megahertz. But I've been told by GTRX AC that the ARM CPU inside might be closer to 200 megahertz on these phones. Okay, to get multiplayer working, one of the phones has to be designated the server host and the other is the client. And there we go, I've now got multiplayer Bluetooth Marble Madness running. Except I'm the only person here awkwardly playing both sides. I'm going to unpair these from each other to test some other things you could do with Bluetooth, such as things you weren't supposed to do with Bluetooth. For example, bluejacking. 
sending small messages to random people around you. This then evolved into even more shady things like blue snarfing for remotely reading files from a target phone, or blue bugging, completely taking over and controlling a victim's phone. The apps I'm using here, Bluver 2 and BT Browser, are useful for testing to see how secure target phones actually are. I'm pleased to see that the K750 is secure. These sorts of Bluetooth issues were mostly a problem for earlier phone models, which I will have to test one day. Okay, let's go deeper and do some firmware hacking. And for this, I'm just going to be using the included USB cable. This is all the hardware you really need to do firmware hacking on these models. To test this cable, I'm first running XS++, and I'm using this to put the phone into an internal file system mode. This is useful for doing things like removing the shutter sound on the camera, getting louder music volumes out of the music player, or even uploading new camera drivers to give better camera performance. All of these were very popular hacks to do on Sony Ericsson phones, but I really want to try some firmware patching. Unfortunately, development stopped on XS++ before firmware patching was fully implemented. So I'm instead switching to a different software package called Sony Ericsson Flash Plugin for Far Manager. I spent a lot of time finding the right version for this phone and getting it all working. Once you get used to it though, it's really good software and very powerful. With the phone connected, there's a few options to start with. O-Flash or OFS for original flashing and B-Flash and B file system for break-in flashing and full file system access. Break-in is sort of similar to the initial part of routing on Android. It gives you full access to the phone system for modification. This is done using hacked loaders from people in the modding scene days, like Hendrix, who really helped open up Sony Ericsson modding for everyone. I find it interesting the way this was called break-in, as if you were breaking into your phone to get to the rewards inside. It's such a different perspective to jailbreaking an iPhone, where you are trying to break out of a walled garden prison that they've put you in. Okay, with the break-in flash mode now activated, I've now got full access to the phone. This is where things get good. Earlier when I flashed this phone back to life, I specifically used the firmware version R4EA031. And that's because this is the firmware version with the most number of firmware patches available which can be used to tweak many aspects of the system and user interface, from changing the system font to expanding the SMS storage size. There's even a patch for bypassing any SIM locks or network locks. But there's another patch I'm much more interested in, allowing access to the phone without any SIM card needed. I really like the way this Sony Ericsson Flash plugin is giving a lot of information about what it's doing. This has also helped me learn why SempTool originally bricked this phone. This is a SID49 certificate phone, which requires flashing a special break-in bootloader to get full access to the phone. But with this bootloader flashed to the phone, the phone won't start up normally. It's only used for break-in flashing and internal file system access. Afterwards, you have to flash a normal startup bootloader back again. And so when Semk Tool had an error, it left the phone with a break-in bootloader that couldn't start the phone. Firmware patching is really awesome, and there are so many patches I still need to try. But next, I want to try something even better, and that's running ELFs. These are executable programs that run at the same access level as the firmware itself. But to get them working, you have to apply two firmware patches. One of them hooks into the firmware to enable you to start ELFs. The other is a library of useful functions, and you have to upload a third file into the internal file system. All these files were really hard to find, at least the most recent versions available were, but eventually I found Denpo's original page on the Wayback Machine, and it had archived the exact files I needed. Thank you to Denpo for all of your hard work, and thank you to Archive.org for saving it. Ok, I've loaded a number of ELFs onto my memory card for testing, and the first ELF I'm running is Boxman, and this is an interesting puzzle game, and the sort of thing I'd like to try out a bit more. It's worth noting that this is not a Java game. Elfs run directly on the phone's system instead of inside a Java sandbox. A good demonstration of this is Snow. This puts falling snow graphics all over the main screen. This is not just an animated screensaver. This is an extension to the inbuilt firmware. And Elfs run with as much control over the phone as the firmware itself. 
There are other ELFs such as CPU Mon. This adds a CPU load percentage to the status bar. There are so many ELVs on here to try out, and this is just a selection of some that I've loaded on here to get started with some testing. There's a grid editor, and it looks like it can change the layout of the main menu. Though at this stage, I'm not reading any of the instructions, and I don't really know what I'm doing, so I'm just pressing buttons. And there's something I didn't do properly, because now the main menu has disappeared completely, and I can no longer use this phone. Fortunately, I can just restart the phone to get it working again. Elves can be made to auto start by putting them in the daemons folder on the memory card. And if there's ever a problem, you can just remove the card and restart the phone. There's also a paint program. I'm really going to have to start reading these instructions for most of these. Though a lot of these instructions are in Russian and have to be translated for an English speaker like myself. There's also this Russian version of Tetris, though not quite Tetris, because a lot of the pieces are not Tetris pieces. A lot of these elves come from a Russian website, which is one of the few remaining Sony Ericsson modding forums. There are a lot of elves that I've tried that don't run properly, or completely crash the phone, and I have to take the battery out to restart. Either I haven't set them up properly, or some have been written for later Sony Ericsson models only. But there is one elf that I've been wanting to try for a really long time, and that's a port of Doom. This is a very impressive port to see running on this phone. Unfortunately, there's no audio. I've been told that the audio support for elves has always been quite limited. Also, I may need to learn how to edit some config files to get the controls to work to actually play the game. For the moment though, I'm really pleased to see this running in demo mode on this phone. This has been a highlight to see in the Sony Ericsson modding experience. I still have a lot more to learn, and there's many more elves I want to try, but that will have to wait for a future Sony Ericsson video. There's also a way to connect these phones to the internet over Bluetooth, and then I can test out the browser or run a third-party browser like Opera. There are also more Sony Ericsson models that I want to try out one day. In particular, I'd love to get a W995. I've been really enjoying the comments from the last video. There's been a huge number of people that had Sony Ericsson phones and really loved their phones. It's actually way more than I was expecting and I'm really pleased by that. Thank you for all your comments and sharing your stories and tips with me. This helps making these videos lots of fun. I have lots more videos planned on many different topics and devices. And if you had a Nokia or a Siemens phone back in the day, don't worry, they are going to appear one day in future videos. But until then, that's it for the moment, and I'll see you next time.